Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, I'm Luca, and as uh, Joe mentioned, I'm working in open robotics, and I'm mostly, I'm, as I'm going to present, uh, the Open Vision Computer 3, which is, uh, which is an open source ROS based uh, smart camera that we've, be that we've been developing for the past uh, two years. So, first of all, okay, a bunch of you know, the usual introductions. Uh, hope. Uh, okay, so uh, that's me, I'm Luca. Uh, and I'm doing mostly like embedded systems development at uh, Open Robotics in Singapore. And then I have a bunch of years uh, experience, you know, embedded systems design. And like, the last three years I've been actually working on drones in the uh, NUS, uh, lab, like T-Lab laboratory. And also a bit of intro on the company. You know, m most, most of you, I guess, if you are here, you know uh, Open Robotics. So we are the company behind uh, the development of ROS. And this is this is maybe what you're not so familiar with. That is, you know, our, our motto that we we uh, we create okay open software and hardware platform for robotics. But like we we as a motto and like as a um, um, like as a re reason behind our work, our, our work, we always have like openness. So we try to make openness the the founding value of most of our work. And okay, you know, just a bit okay of. Publicity, so like we, 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 are, we have been founded, you know, from our, our co-founders are originally from California, but uh, they, we have a big office in Singapore, and, you know, we are k kind of spread all over the world. But anyway, so to the bulk of the presentation, so this is the outline of the presentation, so I will start by giving a bit of background on the motivation why we developed OVC. And then I'll just add a, a tiny bit of history because the project has been going on for over two years to see what brought us to where we are today. And then just give some, some intro on like the architecture, the capabilities, and how you can actually build your own and customize your own for your own application. And then I will uh, pass it to Brandon like, to show some cool demos uh, that he has been working on with the OVC. So first of all, why OVC? Um, if I guess you know most of you people will be working in robotics, and there is usually always a need for like smart cameras in robotics, so you know like like the Z or the real sense. So what what what? So like the, the the very basic feature that most of these cameras would offer is, for example, if you want to do navigation in a complex environment, you would need a stereo in order to estimate depth of object and like to to do segmentation of objects. Uh, so there there is ex solutions for smart cameras. But first of all, uh, none of the solutions existing are open source, so you they cannot really be customized for your own application. And also some of them, like the Z, for example, require a lot of processing from the, re require a lot of processing power from the host PC because they cannot do any processing themselves, which is not the case for Interreal Sense because it can do zero, but the being closed source and not customizable point still remains for all these uh, pro products. So we developed the OVC, which is fully open source, so like all the way from the hardware to the software to the firmware, every, everything is available free of charge on the, on the GitHub, which includes an FPGA, so it means you can, you can offboard some of the computation to your FPGA, uh, so, you, uh, so you don't need to have all the processing on your host computer. But even, even if you don't want to get your hands dirty with FPGA, which I don't know if many of you people work with it before, but it's it's quite a lot of pain to get to work correctly. Uh, even if you don't want to get your hands dirty, we offer like the, the most commonly needed features out of the box, which is the commonly the most commonly needed features being I, like IMU readings that are synchronized with the images, synchronized stereo images, and some like simple uh, feature detection like fast corner detection from the FPGA. And then, okay, so let's, let's give a brief history. So the, it, the, the project started around two years ago. You can see the date 2017 with the first OVC, and, um, which, uh, in, which is there. And this also like the picture that was uh, used in the, meet in the uh, meetup. Uh, the, the, the first OVC and all the OVCs really have been sponsored by the, the University of Pennsylvania. So that's actually their drone that was used in the DARPA FLA program uh, around two years ago. And it, it includes an NVIDIA TX2 and an Alter FPGA. So both the OVC1 and the OVC2 were tailored for the NVIDIA TX2. 
uh, which I will just show actually now the the OVC2, which is kind of like a similar design, but it was designed to be modular, so it can be more customizable in a sense. So it's now a two a two board a two board setup. Um, but again, both of those were tailored for the NVIDIA TX2. And as many of you probably know, uh, recently NVIDIA, NVIDIA released a new computing platform, which is the Xavier, uh, which the, the moment it was released basically made all our work instantly obsolete. Because you know, we, we made so much work into developing like the, the board connectors, which are tailored for the Xavier, for the TX2. Then NVIDIA just released the new one. The connector is completely different. Everything is completely different. So it's, it's completely useless. Um, which, we, which is the, the main issue that we had before, that is that we were constrained to one specific compu compute module. And then also extra aspects that like the, the, the sensor we, are, we were using before were very expensive. So it was also not a very affordable uh, vision system. So now we, we, it brings us to the OVC3, which the OVC3 is at the end of the day, it's literally just a USB device, uh, which you know, similar to what what you know the other the other uh, cameras are. So it, it's um, its purpose is not to be a fully a self-contained you know a, a computer plus camera, but it's just to be a device that you can uh, you can then just connect through USB to your favorite uh, computational platform of choice. It could be a NAC, it could be a Nvidia Xavier, it could be whatever whatever is the latest and most awesome computing platform. Um, and uh, and the, 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 in, the nice thing about it is that, okay, so first of all, we, we built a, a simple version which features just cheaper sensor, cheaper sensors, but then we, we built, um, we include the like, possibility to expand both in hardware. So we allow, um, we, we uh, included additional connectors so you can add m m like better quality sensors, so you can add additional cameras and in software of course because all the software is fully open source and also a plaza like we're using a computational module which has many pin compatible alternatives but then again the computational module here is not this, the core of this platform because we expect the people to use it with their own computational module so here you, you have a picture of the ovc we just you know quickly highlighting some of the features so we we have to, uh, so all the all the sensors are all the images are global shutter, and we have two stereo, uh, two stereo monochrome sense like two monochrome sensors which can be used for stereo, and one RGB sensor which is usually used for uh, object recognition. So if you want to do some deep learning uh, on your on your system, and then we have the we have this four by five centimeter computing module who has uh, both uh, ARM processor and an FPGA and you know, some DDR, some storage. So basically this, this four by five centimeter computing module uh, can like runs a full uh, Ubuntu distribution. So it is, it's literally just a small uh, Ubuntu computer, which from a power point of view, com computational power point of view is somewhere in between, let's say better than a Raspberry Pi, but worse than an Android, something along those lines, because it's still a quad core uh, processor. And then, okay, uh, additional features. So we included a cheaper IMU because as you guys probably saw from the previous, uh, previous slides, uh, we, we used to have like, you know, this vector nav IMU with the order of, in, it was like in the order of thousands of dollars. So no, we, we just said, okay, we are, gonna, we are gonna have a basic version with cheaper sensors and then allow, other, uh, allow everyone to just expand it by including additional sensors if they want, but without forcing them to. And then the, the USB, the USB type C connector, which is both for the power and for the data that can be connected to your machine. And then if you want additional connectivity or storage, you know, you can have ethernet to connect to the internet or you can have SD card if you want to, you know, if you, if you need more than eight gigabytes of storage, which never happened in our case, but you never know. So as I was mentioning, uh, one of the keys like that it can be, it can be just expanded out of the box. So we added four additional connectors, where, and each, each connector can be, can be plugged to uh, a, an, an additional stereo camera. So you could have, if you wanted to, up to 11 cameras running in parallel, uh, which is again, you know, it's, it's a bit overkill, but then we, we have the, 
you know, we have enough bandwidth, we have enough processing power to process all this data, so you know, it, it could be interesting for future applications. And then we, we also added you know, some normal GPIO, which for example nowadays we use, um, which we use for example to, yeah, this, this is an example of a, an expansion board that you can design with the GPIO. So for example, we have some, uh, some more, ex more fancy sensors, like the, you can see the vector nav, uh, or like serial, serial console. So basically, every, every kind of peripheral you would need for your specific application. So this was for a drone application, and they, they wanted, okay, a better quality IMU for navigation. They also wanted a RS-232 to connect to the GPS. They wanted connectivity for a LiDAR. So you know, th this was a very, it was a very simple design, and it was very easy to get it to work compared to the main board. And then, okay, as, as I mentioned, you know, you, we, we also, so all, all the design now, including the last two, are, are open source. So this is what the, the camera expansion board looks like, which is literally just two images connected with a cable to the other board. And this one is still under development. This, this one we still didn't, didn't build it yet. This was from the hardware point of view. But then, uh, if, if we look at the software, so the, the, the nice thing is that, OK, so, um, um, because, because at the end of the day, we are, is the, the OVC is just a computer running Ubuntu. You can just, like, you can use the whole Ubuntu ecosystem and you can run, uh, you, like, you, so you can, like, build your own custom, you, your own applications and you, you, like, you, you don't need to do any, any low level software or anything because you can use the existing libraries. And additionally, because we have an FPGA, you can, you can, you know, port your algorithms to the, to the FPGA. So to, to reduce the, the computational load on your, uh, on your machine. Uh, and yes, yeah, so currently we are doing uh, fast corner detection on the FPGA. OK, now just, just a bit of an overview on the architecture. If you know, anyone was interested in uh, building, their own, like building it and using it for their own application. So the, 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 way, the way it works is that uh, it's a USB Ethernet gadget. So it's some, something similar to when you connect your phone through USB to your computer, and then you use it to connect to the internet. So the, the, the nice thing about it is that it doesn't require any driver or any, of, of any source from your machine. So you literally plug it to your computer through USB. You run a ROS, a ROS master on your machine. And then the OVC will automatically detect the ROS master running on your machine. And you will start publishing all the data, which in this case is images, IMU, and features. Which is, is a nice to have because you know it's like it's basically fully plug and play. You just need an Ubuntu and a ROS running, and you don't need to install anything else. And then okay, so some details on like the hardware, which we, we synchronize the the we, we because it's, it's very important for uh, visual auto visual inertial odometry applications to have synchronized IMU and imagers. So we we, synchroni we synchronize them together and we stamp them with the ROS time. So again, like uh, the, because we stamp them with the ROS time, um, the, 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 the time itself is already in a format that is easy to integrate with the, any ROS package uh, that you might be running. And then, OK, as I mentioned, you know, we also like corner detection, because uh, this is, again, something that was developed uh, with um, with, our, like with UPEN previously, because they, they told us, you know, so we have a whole pipeline that we run on the drones, but the most expensive, um, the most expensive task that we that we need to run is the corner detection. So can you guys port it to the FPGA? Then we said, okay, we, uh, let's do it. We did it, and now, like now, we just uh, make it open source as the rest of the stack. Um, so, so we also we also output uh, corner features which can be used for you know your visual odometry pipelines. And now, okay, just the last few uh, last part that is about how you can uh, build like customize your own and build your own for your own application. So again, uh, all the design files are available. You know, uh, they are open source and. Uh, I believe the license is actually a very permissive license, which can be used for 
Like it's not GPL, so you can use it for commercial applications, I believe. But I'm only 80% sure about that. Um, and then, and then you know, as as nice to have, um, uh, we, we also provide by like we also provide like binary images because, I mean, as a, as an open source user myself, I know that it's it's co it's always cool to have all the source. So it's like you know, oh, I, I have all the source, I can change it, I can modify it. But 99% of the times, I just want to take the thing and run it without bothering about you know rebuilding everything. So we we also provide binary image which you can just load on your on your OVC. And also we provide a feature to automatically update it over the internet. So uh, so you, you so you don't like as from a user point of view you don't need to worry too much about you know developing or anything if you just want something that works and with the latest uh, features. So let's say, let's say for example now you wanted to customize it for your own application. Well, as I mentioned, let's say the hardware is is open, and it, it's been it's been designed with the with this EDA software called Keycheck, which is also open source, and the, all the design all the design files are available in our repository for any sort of customization you might want to do. And then, if you wanted to customize, let's say the FPGA part or if you wanted to customize the embedded Linux. Again, all the, all the design files are available free of charge. Uh, and the, 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 let's say the minor issue here is that the tools themselves, be, they are provided by Xilinx, which is the, uh, is the company that designed the FPGA. And they are not open source, but at least they are, like, the version we are using if, uh, is available free of charge because we are just using simple features, a simple, a simple FPGA board. So we, we don't need to actually pay any license, like no one needs to pay any license fee to actually customize uh, their designs. And finally, the software, which as I mentioned is, uh, b because we are just running an embedded Ubuntu, then you can just you know, connect to your embedded Ubuntu and then you know, like, he already runs ROS, so if you want, you can run pre-existing ROS packages or OpenCV or like anything that really is in the Ubuntu ecosystem, you can just uh, run it on the computer. And uh, just as a small note here, so like um, actually what, what, what we used to do in my previous lab was something like push uh, to the FPGA all the processing and just leave to the uh, ARM processor to the onboard Ubuntu the higher level tasks like let's say uh, decision making or like navigation so, we, so actually it was it was quite uh, simple to to make a device like not exactly this device but a similar device a fully um, a fully like self-contained uh, com computational module for robotics application which was also cool because it's very low it's very low power it's very light it's very small but now let's go to the interesting part, which is just a few simple demos about it. And for that, I will introduce Brendan. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. So like this is the this is the It's a nice software uh, software uh, uh, we have a lot of fire, like soon. But uh, I just want to show you what I'm actually okay. running on my. Computer first. How do I keep it? Okay, okay, thanks. Oh, okay, yeah. So actually, currently I'm running uh, ROS Core on my computer. So you can see that the ROS Core is running here, and you can tell that uh, the OVC is connected because there's a Ethernet interface over here. So like, if I actually wanted to, right, I could just uh, SSH into the OVC if I wanted to. So. And I mean, hooray, yeah, but like, we don't need to mess around with the OVC inside, so that's fine. Yeah. So first things first, I just want to show that like, uh, we have all the nice images. So the left and right cameras are mono cameras. So this is the left image, this is the right image, and then we have RGB feed as well in the middle camera. And then, like, of course, you can focus it if you want to or not. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's the image output demo. Uh, for the next one, uh, we're gonna look at 
some corners, and you can see that uh, we are finding a lot of corners. So, so that's nice. Uh, let me run the corner detector. And you can see that, uh, okay, so, so what you're actually seeing, right, okay, is the corners that are detected by the FPGA and then OpenCV in, for comparison, okay? So, like, like, the reason why there's actually a lot more corners in OpenCV is because, like, uh, the threshold is actually set lower. But then here, the FPGA algorithm has a separate threshold that we're setting. And you can see that the corners that are detected are actually quite stable, so that's nice. Yeah. We yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me uh, kill that first so I can run my other demos. Okay. Uh, for the next one, actually, uh, I basically use the two cameras to actually fuse the images together to form a disparity point cloud. I can actually do a live demo now, but you can just look at the YouTube video just to make sure that, like, you know, yeah, it works. But let's actually do it live. Give me a sec, huh? Okay. So like, uh, can I, can't really see myself. Yeah, so you can see that like, uh, the display key actually works quite well. I mean, like, you can see that the screen is getting captured and... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Great. I think having the lights will be nicer, but never mind. It's just fine, yeah. Uh, let me, let me make it look 3D to you. Whoa! <laughs> yeah, okay, anyway. Yeah, so if you have 3D point clouds, right, you can actually do a lot of cool stuff with it. So, okay, let me just kill the... Yeah, if you have 3D point clouds, you can obviously do 3D mapping. So actually, this is a map of the office if it wants to load, right? But uh, why not? Let's just make a map of this area, hopefully with the lights on. Lights Sorry, <laughs> yeah. Maybe all of them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wait, hold on, I need to uh, set up some stuff. Let's give me a sec. Sorry. So now if I just like selfie stick myself around the room, we can slowly construct a map of the entire area. So you can also tell that like, uh, because we have a point cloud in already, we can actually do a bit of visual autometry to actually tell whether, to actually tell where the camera is actually pointing and where the camera's uh, position is at. Yep. And then, of course, because this is ROS, right, you can just turn the 3D point cloud that you generate into a navigatable 2D map, and then you can just, like, throw robots at it and then have fun, you know. Uh, of course, you can also save this map and then, I don't know, maybe uh, forever immortalize this meetup in a 3D point cloud form. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, like, if you want to actually look at the map itself, right, uh, of course, uh, the further away your, your points are from the camera, the slightly worse the disparity matching will actually perform because you only have uh, two $10 cameras just like on the OVC working and running. But uh, it's, it's quite nice to see it working 
fairly well from like a single vantage point. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, other applications that we've actually used it for uh, are okay. Like I did cylinder segmentation for the point cloud to try to test out the object object recognition capabilities of the OVC. So this is me with uh, like a random bottle. And basically, I'm leveraging PCL, which is uh, the point cloud library with ROS to try to detect a cylinder. So like, uh, you can see that it's detecting a cylinder. Yeah. And then basically, uh, we use that cylinder detection to basically get a robotic arm to just automatically pick up uh, a water bottle. So the arm that you actually see there is the Berkeley Blue arm, which is supposed to be a low-cost research uh, compliant arm. You can probably ask me about that uh, later. Yeah. So you can see that I have a move it interface interacting with the arm, and I'm feeding in the cylinder detection into the arm control pipeline. Maybe I should speed it up, but yeah. Of course, it grabs the bottle, and that's nice. Right? But then, like, uh, in order to make sure that like I'm not cheating, right? Uh, the next step actually has me tilting the water bottle, and then you can also see that uh, the cylinder is actually detected as a tilted cylinder, and then the arm will just automatically move in position appropriately. Yeah, uh, so the reason why the arm is like that is because I just programmed it to just uh, assume the pose that's like 5 or 10 cm above the bottle center of mass and then to actually go in for the approach. Yeah, because I was a bit lazy, but yeah. So yeah, it works. Hooray! Yep. Okay. And then uh, we also played around with uh, two different algorithms. So, so actually, the stereo disparity algorithms are available in the stereo image prop node that's available in the ROS ecosystem uses, uh, uh, has two stereo algorithms that, that you can actually use, mainly because it's built on OpenCV. And this is just a comparison of the better algorithm and the worse algorithm. Yeah. So as you can see over here, right, there are two algorithms. There's the first one, which is stereo BM, and the second one, which is stereo SGBM, which stands for semi-global block matching. So currently, uh, I want you to pay attention to this top right-hand corner uh, Arvis window. So you can see that the point clouds here are not that well formed, but the moment I change over to the second algorithm, you can tell that the point clouds are actually a lot more fully formed. And I just keep swapping back and forth between them. Yeah. As you can see also, that the fidelity of the point cloud is actually quite nice. Yeah. And then if you go back to SBM, it's not so good, and then zero SGM is quite good. So yeah. And then, of course, if you have a point cloud, you can actually do visual inertial odometry. So uh, I have a pipeline that I'm going to run now that's using the very cheap IMU and the stereo camera capabilities to actually get some fairly, fairly OK odometry for what it's worth. Yeah. So, so, so let me just run it first. Okay, so uh, this visual automatry pipeline is actually leveraging the RTAP map ROS node that I was running to do the mapping just now. But then uh, now there's actually uh, both. Okay, okay. So, so if you actually look at the Arvis window, right, you will see a red arrow and a yellow arrow. Okay, the red arrow is the post estimate that's generated by the visual automatry node, and the yellow arrow is the 
is the sensor fusion of the visual odometry pose and the IMU pose. Okay. Uh, I didn't really tune the common filter that well yet, so you might see uh, some drifting, but hopefully it works. Okay. So if I turn it around, right, you can actually tell that like you can track it somewhat well as long as the visual odometry node has a map to compare against. And because I just started it, it's not really comparing that well yet. But so if I turn it, okay, maybe if I turn it the other way. So if I move it up, it goes up, if I move it down, it goes down, and yeah. So pretty, pre pretty good for a fairly cheap sensor suite. Uh, you can imagine if you actually fuse this data with like encoders or better IMUs or maybe like some GPS, you could actually get a fairly good post estimate. Okay, uh, when I drop this camera, uh, because there's no map, it's going to go crazy. So we, yeah, okay. And then uh, I just got this working today, but uh, we actually have a slightly better visual geometry pipeline called SVO that's actually done by ETH by ETHZ, and I'm going to demo it for you. Yeah. So uh, if you want to know more about this particular pipeline, uh, you can go check out that particular website. But the bad thing about that website is they only provide the binary; they don't provide the source code, so it's a bit sad. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm also going to just show you how I started because it's it's quite annoying to to start it. So uh, I hope I didn't just kill something. Oh no. Okay, I'll, I'll just I'll just rerun it. Yeah. So the problem is uh, because my computer is using Ubuntu 18 uh, with ROS Melodic, but SVO is only supported on Kinetic and Indigo. So the solution is to use Docker. So I'm just going to start some Docker nodes. Okay, and I'm also going to go into my other workspace on my computer to do the visualization. So just give me a sec. Okay, so let's start the visualization first. So this is the SVO visual visualization. And uh, hopefully this works. Okay, so now it's trying to look for features to detect. Okay, it found some features already, so that's nice. So if I actually move it around, you can actually tell that uh, it's using both the IMU and the visual geometry to generate the final post. So I'm just collecting a bunch of features first. Uh, if you want to see the image, let me just blow up the image first. Oh, damn it. Oh, it crashed. Let me restart it. So you can at least see the feature detection first. Yeah. So actually, the way this works is it tries to find features in an image, and then from successive images, it actually tries to predict the depth to build a point cloud map. And then uh, from that, you can actually get some form of visual geometry. And if the map has been produced fairly well, uh, you can have a very dynamic environment, and it won't actually run. So uh, I'm going to start waving my hands around in front of the camera soon after I minimize this image. So just give me a sec. Okay. So this is the point cloud from the features that's being generated. You can tell that uh, there's a bit of drift, lah, but it's fine. If I wave my hand in front of the camera, the odometry is actually quite stable. Which is interesting, because normally if you have a stereo camera, uh, this will lead it to just completely die. Yep. And then, of course, if I just move around, uh, you can actually tell that it's tracking fairly well. Yeah, uh, the wire is a bit loose. Uh, sorry, short, so I can't really do much. But yeah. So, so, so that's nice. Yeah, 
Actually, the, the post inferencing speed for each frame is about 7 milliseconds. So this is something that you could actually potentially use. Yeah. You can also like, yeah. If you swing it around too much, then because there's a bit of motion blur, then it just loses the post. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, that's it. So uh, okay. I'll just pass the mic back to Luca. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So it's probably like saying, okay, okay um, this is a bit of VR. Okay. So in the uh, VR. Okay. Okay. Oh, let's do it. Hop. Hey. Yes. Okay. Well, the, the surprise is gone, but we are hiring. So uh, this is, you see, you can see a wonderful team at our latest wonderful team event where we went to play mini golf a few weeks ago. Uh, so, you know, like we, we, we have quite a few very cool projects happening in Singapore. We like the government and like, uh, like automating the whole healthcare environment. So you know, if, you, if you guys are into robotics and you want to like change the healthcare environment in Singapore, you know, go and check the website send us a message and let us know. Hope. And I think that is actually all. Yes. Um, just, okay, just to, to really kind of wrap up the presentation, um, I would say there is like two sides uh, to this presentation. So, you know, the, the first side was like the, the whole hardware, you know, like you, there is this camera, you can use it for your applications and so on. But the second side that may, may be even more important that was shown by Brandon is uh, how the how mature the ROS ecosystem is. So you know, once we get this data into the ROS ecosystem, uh, how like how much open source uh, software there is out there that we can just use to solve common problems such as you know uh, object segmentation and the stereo 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 matching and like depth estimation or like mapping visual odometry and all this sort of stuff. So you now if by by using you know sensors that are compatible with the with the ROS ecosystem, like what I personally believe is that you can really, you know, you can like speed up the development of your application and, you know, hopefully like le by leveraging like all these uh, open source, open source solutions that someone else develop, uh, developed for you already, instead of, you know, solving the same problem by yourself. Anyway, yeah, so that's all. If you have questions, me or Brandon, we will be happy to take them. I uh, thank you. Yes. So now that uh, Jensen <coughs> Nano has actually released the chipset as well, are you, do you have any plans of supporting a GPU to support the deep learning community as well? You know, be very important. So to support the GPU, in, but like, I, I guess, you know, because the, um, like, Again, like the difference is that now it, this is only a device. So like as long as, you know, let's say the Jetson, does the Jetson Nano have just, you know, a USB port that like it can use? So like basically if you have a ma any machine with a USB 3 port, you can, you know, just plug it and just, you know, get like get your data output basically. So like it, it doesn't really make any difference whether it's a Jetson or it's a Droid or it's a full desktop or a laptop. Oh, is it, is it the building chip that you're using for the camera? Ah, the chip itself. Um, I wouldn't say so because the, the nice thing about having an FPGA is that we can have like a ton of peripherals that like maybe you wouldn't be able to have with let's say an NVIDIA chip because you cannot reconfigure it so much. So for example, you know, we can have, I think right now we have like a lot of like different I2C communication happening in parallel, SPI, serials, like MIPI for the cameras. We have at least like 10 or 15 different like communications happening in parallel. And if you, if you went for a chip that it cannot really be reconfigured completely, then I don't think you would be able to achieve that, yeah. Yes. Come. All right. All right. So I will pass the, the mic back to Joe. All right. Uh, I actually talked about a uh, service robot that, that me and my team have been making, talk more about, but, uh, I mean, yeah, since, since it's relevant now, I guess I'll just show it again. So, yeah, this is one year later. Move on. So, it's so actually, uh, we built this service robot called MomoBot, uh, based off of uh, Joe's Dino Robot framework. Yeah, so MomoBot stands for M -O uh, uh, Mo Modular Mobile Robot. So, like, it's, it's meant to be top modular, so like, you can remove the the top and change all of different stuff, but, but, <laughs> yeah. but uh, we were leveraging some interesting uh, human-robot interaction principles. 
So uh, mainly focusing on the eyes and a bit of voice. So uh, you can actually see the robot roaming around in the exhibition. So you can see the eyes. Yeah. So it's a cute boy. And we also found that putting a software on top of it actually makes it a lot more approachable. So like, you can charge people with the with the robot and people will not really care that much. So, so that's nice. We also had kids like, playing around with it and they really like to hit the piece stop at the back, which is sad, but I mean, you know. Yeah. So of course it's running ROS, uh, it's running the ROS navigation stack, uh, and yeah. yeah. I wonder if I have sound, yeah, I can have sound. Okay, great. So, so that's, that, that's the eye portion. Uh, uh, but I just want to share that like the entire stack is actually on GitHub with full, full, with full documentation. So uh, if anyone wants to build their own copy of Momobot, they can actually just do that. Yeah. You can just Google Momobot. But uh, please don't Google Momobot because you might get scared with like uh, uh, pasta and you know, scary stuff. Yeah. yeah. And then actually for the emotions, uh, there's a package that you can actually just plug and play for any of your own robots. So the uh, eyes are actually barely controlled and they respond to the normal velocity messages that you can send to control robots with. Yeah. Yeah, and they bring uh, like automatically. Okay. Uh, because I can't get the sound working, I can't really play the, the voice lines. But like, you want to listen to the voices in Terminator. And then, uh, another, one I want to, another thing I want to share is uh, thanks to Joe Swamp, uh, his work has managed to get on the news. So actually, Momo ended up on the news. So that's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's it. Thanks, Brendan.